Good morning, my friends, and thank you for joining me for Facebook Live. My name is John Phipps, lead pastor of Park Place Church here in Pinellas Park, Florida. It is an honor to be with you this morning. I want to thank you guys for joining me. Uh, last night, some of you, we had about 30, maybe even more than 30 at our Bible study uh, that came to our sanctuary in person. Some of you watched from home, and uh, it was a lot of fun. We had some great questions and comments from different people. Uh, it was awesome. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, listen, it's every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. in our church sanctuary. You can come in and wear a mask the whole time. You don't have to speak, though it is interactive, so you can speak if you want to. And I see your names there. Good morning, my friends, all the usual suspects. Eileen, good to see you this morning. And uh, it's good to be here. I'll wave back at you. I do have Monty in here with me this morning, so he's a little restless. I've had Monty with me for three days now. Good to see you, Christina. And Pastor Pat, thank you for joining me. I'm waving back at you and losing my phone in the process. Okay, here we are. Losing my phone. Sorry. We're not off to a good start, but it's going to get better. Okay, here we are. So, uh, there may come a time in which Monty is excused from this room. We'll see how he does. And um, I just want to share with you last night that um, my Bible study went really well. We had a lot of really good input from a lot of people and questions that were very difficult. I did my best to answer. Um, but listen, I posted it to my Facebook page. It's also on the Park Place Facebook page. It's on my Facebook page. It is an hour long, but some of it is really, really good. Jan, how are you, my friend? Praying for you and for your wonderful brother, Martin. Thank you for joining us, guys. We've already got 20 people on here, so... Uh, it is time to begin, and I hope you're ready. If you have your Bible with you, open, fantastic. We are going to be flipping around to some different scriptures today, and uh, looking forward to that. We are talking about the fruit of the Spirit, all right? The fruit of the Spirit. Now, if we look at Galatians 5, and 23, we find the fruit of the Spirit. Um, now, the fruit of the Spirit is different from... The gifts of the Spirit. I think you probably already know that, but let's take a look at Galatians. And Galatians chapter 5. Now there's nine fruits of the Spirit, okay? And um, when I say that the fruit of the Spirit is different from the gifts of the Spirit, here's the deal. Today we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and tomorrow we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And this is really going to be an overview because I could spend weeks talking about the fruit of the Spirit and weeks talking about the gifts of the Spirit. But I'm not going to do that. This was a special request by somebody. And um, I want to just kind of spend some time with you um, on an overview so that you understand the difference. They're not the same things. They are different. But the fruit of the Spirit is what we're talking about today from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Okay, hope you're ready. Here we go. But the fruit of the Spirit, according to the Apostle Paul, written to the letter of Galatia, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the fruit of the Spirit, my friends. Now, let me just remind you <clears throat> that uh, there is a vine and there are branches and there are fruit, okay? So before we get into these nine particular um, fruits, <clears throat> we're going to talk about where the fruits came from. So who's the vine? Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, okay? And I love that. If you stay connected to the vine, you will produce much fruit, Jesus said. So if he is the vine, we are the branches, okay? We've been grafted in. He is the vine. He's strong, steady. We are the branches. We kind of float around, you know. Sometimes we are a little wobbly sometimes, right, when we struggle with different things in this world. But the branch is connected and get its sustenance from the vine. And then we are the branches. And then finally, we produce fruit or we don't produce fruit. You can be a branch and not produce fruit. Think about that for a moment. 
Uh, I know at our house, we've got to trim our trees and sometimes we get flowers and sometimes we don't. But if I trim them the right way, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if I trim the branches the right way, um, the way I'm supposed to, what happens? They produce fruit or flowers. If I don't trim them the right way, what happens? They might die. So if the Lord is the vine, we are the branches, and we are able to produce fruit like a fruit tree, I want to ask you, if, it, if it's God's responsibility to prune the branches, why do we push back as if we're surprised that God is doing this? God wants you to produce fruit. Jesus said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. God wants you to produce fruit, my friends. So he's going to ensure that you are a branch that has the ability, the capability to produce fruit. And you will produce fruit, my friends, because he's going to ensure that you're going to produce fruit. Now, the only way you're not going to produce fruit is if you're pushing back against God all the time. You are resisting the pruning. But he will prune the branches to make sure that you produce the most amount of fruit that you possibly can. God has done that in my life. I honestly believe 25 years of my life I've been in preparation for Park Place Church. And now when God felt I was ready, because I wasn't ready before, God put me at Park Place Church. Dean, Sweet Dean and I are here because God thinks we're ready. And we're trying to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, allowing the gardener okay to not worry about the vine so god is the gardener jesus is the vine but obviously he's got the freedom to prune and trim the branch to make sure that we produce fruit the way we need to so the gifts of the spirit receive more attention than the fruit of the spirit okay let me say that again the gifts of the spirit which we're going to talk about tomorrow they always receive more attention than the fruit of the spirit but they're both important but I just read to you that the fruit of the Spirit is nine things, taken from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay? So this is very powerful, my friends. As we look closely at these particular passages of scriptures, that been written by the Apostle Paul. Um, we're going to be examining other biblical passages that exemplify these virtues. My friends, this is all part of the sanctified life. If you are sanctified, that is if the Holy Spirit is working in your life, okay, you will produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What does it mean, Pastor, when you say with keeping with repentance? When you are in keeping with repentance, what you are doing is you are being honest about your shortcomings. You are being repentant for the areas of your life that need increase or need attention. Okay, so that means you are allowing God to come in and prune you. It doesn't feel good to be pruned. If you're a branch, it doesn't feel good to be prodded and poked and, 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 and snipped and whatever, you know, whatever a gardener would do for these branches into these vines. And so when that happens, my friends, yes, it can be a little bit painful to us. Yes. Uh, can you come and get Montgomery? Yes. Give him a bag of chips? Yes. Thank you. All right, Monty's going for a field trip. <clears throat> Sorry, bud. You didn't, make, you didn't make the cut. Can't stay. But you're going to have fun with Wendy. She'll be here for you in a minute. All right, so as I continue teaching, thank you for that little time out there. I'm always a dad. And uh, I love my work as a dad, and that's really important. So hopefully I've helped you to understand why we have the fruit of the Spirit. It is the sanctified life. Come on in. Bye, Monty. Just one bag, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, when we're working with the Lord, he has the right to prune and to take care of us in the way that's going to help us produce fruit. I remember when I got uh, some rose bushes and planted them for Dina. Well, when the season was over, I cut the rose bushes almost to the ground because I was told that's what you do. And then they come up and they're bigger and better the next year. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it technically, it actually worked. But when I cut her rose bushes, she was upset with me. She came into the house. She was angry. She wanted to know what I did that, 
was I mad at her? I mean, all these things, you know. And, and I said, no, 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 no. The season's over. We've gotten beautiful roses from these rose bushes. But I trimmed them down. I had to trim the entire uh, rose bush, tree, whatever, bush, um, down so that when it comes back, it'll be stronger and more beautiful than it was before. And once she understood that, she thanked me. So sometimes that pruning hurts, my friends. But that pruning is a good thing because when God is pruning you, he is taking off some of those bad edges, some of that, some of that, uh, that dead stuff that is growing out of you that's not healthy. He's pruning that. He's shearing that so that healthy things will grow in its place. Remember, the Bible says, do not despise the Lord's discipline. He disciplines those he loves and calls son uh, and daughters. It's all part of the pruning process. All right, I'm 10 minutes into this. I haven't even gotten into the nine fruits of the Spirit. Are we ready? What is the first one, my friends? The first one is love. The word love is often abused these days by our culture. I spoke on this a couple days ago when I was talking about lust and the difficulty that uh, especially young people have with lust, but, but everyone, you know, at different times struggles with this. Love and lust are two different things. This is a fruit of the Spirit. Now, the word love is often misunderstood in our society, <clears throat> but it's not misunderstood in our church, okay? Or our church is, the universal church is what I'm referring to. The word love is not misrepresented in the Bible. And it talks about love here in verse 22 because it's the first fruit of the Spirit. Now, it is used in the context of close cozy feelings that are passionate in our world, okay? Oftentimes, we confuse love and lust within our society, even our, our Hollywood movies and all that nonsense, you know, and, 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 and that's just not what the Bible is talking about. But from the Christian point of view, what is this thing called love? What is love? It's not what we hear about on the radio. It's not what comes out of Hollywood. It's not what the world perceives as love or love at first sight. It's not about that. In this study, we're going to kind of understand what John, Jesus' disciple and close friend, says about love. Okay? So we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. If you want to flip over to 1 John chapter 4, you don't have to. I'll read it for you. <clears throat> Amen. Um, I agree, Pastor Pat and Sandy. The world needs love. All right, so we're going to be talking about 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Okay? Hang in there with me. It's a long passage of Scripture, but this is one of the greatest um, examples of love. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we may live through him. This is love, in verse 10. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him, and he in us. He has given us his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God and lives in him, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. I love that. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, in God in them. Verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus, if we love. So that's very clear, my friends. That is what love is. God is love. And his spirit is in us. 
and we can't help but love others, even our enemies. The Bible says to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you will be a Christian and known by your love. We all remember that song. Now, the second virtue that we're going to be talking about is joy. When we hear the word joy, it's a beautiful word. In fact, my mom's name is Joy. Not my biological mom, my mother-in-law. Her name is Joy. And by the way, congratulations, mom. You just She just sold her house uh, in Las Vegas. Dina's parents and grandmother are moving here to St. Petersburg, Florida, or Largo, Florida. We're happy for them. Her name is Joy. When we hear the name Joy, we are likely to connect it with some special event that brought us joy. One such amazing event we see in scripture is Jesus' encounter with believers on the road to Emmaus. We explore what their encounter with Jesus teach us about joy, not just during special experiences, but also in our daily lives. I say we stop and take a minute and explore what the Bible has to say about joy. So turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? <clears throat> Luke 24. You know, I still say that every time I look up scripture. Just like you do. Got to make sure I get it right. We're looking at Luke 24, verse 33. Now, <clears throat> we're talking about joy. So I'm going to be speaking... Luke 24, 33 through 53. So hang in there with me, okay? We're talking about joy. <clears throat> they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus had recognized was recognized by them when they broke the bread. Now it's referring to the men that walked along the road to Emmaus. And so they were so excited that they met the Lord on the road to Emmaus, which is a wonderful story. I encourage you to read it. It's in the same chapter, Luke 24. So these men went back and told the disciples that they had walked with Jesus after the crucifixion, okay, after he was buried. And now Jesus is returning, okay, in all his glory. But let's look at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself, himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence to remind them that he was who he said he was. He wasn't a ghost. It wasn't that Jesus was hungry. He did it for their benefit. He said to them, <clears throat> This is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Verse 46, he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name to all nations. That's the gospel, my friends. The gospel isn't preaching heartfelt, feel-good messages. The gospel is just, is just this. Jesus is saying, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. What is the gospel? The gospel is that your life can be changed by the blood of Jesus. If you will repent and receive salvation, then you will receive joy. Verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. Verse 49, I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. 
While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. That's joy, my friends. There is no greater joy than walking with Jesus and having his Holy Spirit empower you. The sanctifying work that happens within us Christians is love, joy, and the third one is peace. We live in a tense, anxious time. We live in uncertain time. How can we know the peace of God when the world seems to be falling apart around us? Now examine Isaiah's prophetic message delivered to God's people who were living in a situation like ours of profound difficulty, exile in Babylon. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to the Old Testament. Isaiah 43. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. I'll read it for you. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> We're doing okay on time. i got to speed it up a bit. We're talking about peace. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 7. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Siva in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you. I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. That is the peace of God, my friends. I love it. We're talking about peace, the third virtue of the fruit of the Spirit. He said, I will give you peace. Do not fear, I have redeemed you. I love that. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will be set ablaze, but you won't be burned. My friends, that is powerful. And I know there's nine virtues. We've only worked through three. But let's go to number four. Number four is patience. Let's face it. Some people drive us up the wall. That's an old adage. It just means they drive us crazy. Jesus sets a powerful example of patience, particularly in the care of the disciples who bickered about being the greatest. This scripture explores Jesus' teaching in response to their bickering, exploring the mindset and attitude we ought to have toward other people. My friends, from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. I'm not going to read it for you. We're going to get through this in one session. Otherwise, I could break this up in two or three sessions, and probably you're saying, I wouldn't mind. But I do want to get through the fruit of the Spirit, so tomorrow we can talk about the gifts of the Spirit. But let me just tell you, Jesus is saying, who of you wants to be great? Who of you wants to be the greatest? He must become like a little child. Think about that for a minute. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be last. For the last will be first and the first will be last, my friends. But you have to have patience. Patience is a virtue. All of these fruits of the Spirit are virtues. They are the attributes of God that he gives to his children that he gives to us, it's part of that process of sanctification. That work of the sanctification begins when we give our heart to Jesus, and it continues as long as we are obedient and we submit to the Holy Spirit of God. My friends, we will be given patience. It is a fruit of the Spirit, but you don't get it all at once. 
I certainly didn't. I didn't get the patience I have now when I got saved. Um, I had to ask and pray for patience. And I had to ask God to give me patience. And, and believe me, I had a lot of trouble with this. This is one of the, the fruits of the Spirit that I struggled with more than anything else. Patience with my children. Patience with Dina. Patience with church members. Patience with church boards. Patience with just people in the world. We have to be patient, my friends. Jesus was very patient with the Pharisees. Jesus was very patient with Peter, James, and John. And then five, kindness. How can the fruit of kindness poured through us make a difference in our cynical culture? I think you will agree with me that our culture is cynical. Our culture is ungodly. Uh, I don't believe this is a Christian nation. I, I believe we have some, some Christian examples, some undertones. I understand that. But we have a cynical culture, my friends. This is not a Christian culture. But back to kindness. This passage shows this virtue by looking at the countercultural kindness David showed to Jonathan's descendants. We find this in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 9. So listen, I encourage you to read that on your own. But David showed great kindness to Saul's family. Remember, King Saul was the predecessor of David. Okay, he tried to take David's life. David was very patient with King Saul, but then he showed kindness. David didn't kill Saul. Saul died along with his sons, uh, especially Jonathan, who was David's friend, in battle. Now, there was a time in which David said, you know, I want to do something for Saul and his family. So find a descendant of Saul and report back to me. You can read the chapter. Again, this is 2 Samuel chapter 9. And they found this young man. I believe it was young. And I can't remember his name, but it's in the chapter. And he was disabled. And uh, he said, bring him here. And they did. They brought him to King David. And he said, you will eat at my table. And you won't have to worry about anything. You are a descendant of King Saul. And I will show kindness to you. Boy, if David can do that for one of his enemies, you know, it was an enemy, yes. The Bible tells us to love our enemies, and David loved Saul. <clears throat> he really did. So you can have an enemy and still show love, my friends. Okay? That sounds contradicting, and some of you are going to struggle with that. But you shouldn't. The Bible says, love your enemies. Jesus didn't say they're not your enemy. Pretend you're their friend. Jesus didn't say pretend they're your friends. He said, they're your enemies, fine. They oppose you, fine. They despise you, fine. They're an enemy, but love them anyway. And then finally, show kindness to them, just as King David did to Saul's descendant. This, 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 this young, disabled person uh, was shown great kindness. Another virtue is goodness. Okay, this is the sixth virtue of the fruit of the Spirit. Psalm 107 is great. It is the classic exposition of God's goodness. God's actions reveal goodness in his highest and purest form. His goodness provides the standard for developing this fruit in our personal lives. So I want you to take time to also read Psalm 107, where it talks about the goodness of God that is being poured out on us. Goodness when we deserve condemnation. Goodness when we deserve, um, you know, um, uh, unforgiveness. Goodness when we deserve bad things to come upon us for all the bad things we've done. You know, in the Old Testament, they say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? But Jesus said, long ago you heard this, but I tell you, you know, love your neighbor you know, love those who persecute you, love your enemies, you know, all of this. We are to show goodness to others, not only Christians and those who like us. For what reward will we get? For we love those who love us, uh, the Lord says. But how much more will we be blessed if we show kindness and goodness to those who don't love us, who don't like us, who abuse us, or even victimize us? We are to show goodness to all people and God shows goodness in Psalm 107. All right, 
Virtue number seven, as we're working through this, is faithfulness. Now, we're going back to the Old Testament. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, learned about faithfulness the hard way. He made an alliance that was against God's will. Have you ever done that? You ever made an alliance with someone against God's will or, or did something against God's will? Or I remember one time, I'm going to speak honestly, I started a company with a partner and uh, he did not align his life with the Lord. And uh, it, was a, it was a mistake. I basically aligned myself with someone who was not faithful to the Lord and wouldn't be faithful to me. And we had to get attorneys involved at some point. It was some stuff going on. It, it, it didn't matter. He's serving the Lord now. He's actually a born-again Christian now. And, he, and, he, and he, he credits that to me and the testimony that I had with him, the love that I showed him. At least I tried to. But nevertheless, my friends, um, Jehoshaphat, made an alliance that was against God's will. The results were disastrous. They always will be. And God was displeased. In his desperation, Jehoshaphat cried out to God. This scripture gives God's answer, which serves as an amazing illustration of faithfulness. Okay? Now, if you're keeping notes, I want you to write down 2 Corinthians 20, verses 1 through 30, faithfulness. 2 Chronicles 20, verses 1 through 30. Some of you are like, Pastor, why don't you take three days on this? Go through these scriptures with us. We want to hear about Jehoshaphat. We want to hear about this ungodly alliance that he made and, and how he had to, to come back and come to a place of repentance. But my friends, listen to me. You should be also studying to show yourself approved, not just me reading every verse for you and, and you know, um, feeding you as babies. Do this on your own. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 30. Make it, you know, a daily devotion to read this one and then tomorrow's devotion to read Psalm 107 about goodness and, and kindness, 2 Samuel chapter 9. These are large portions of scripture that will really help you and benefit you. So the seventh... Um, Virtue, which is a fruit of the Spirit, is faithfulness. Number eight, and there's nine total. We're going to finish shortly. Gentleness. For some, the word gentleness has a negative connotation, such as weakness or being overpowered. Gentleness is often equated with a pushover in our society. Others recognize gentleness as a sorely needed quality in a harsh world but aren't sure how to cultivate it in their own lives. So to be a gentle person does not mean you are a doormat. I'm going to remind you of something, and you, you may disagree with it, and I'm fine if you do. Now, the, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said the second is like it, to um, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, we call this the Shema, okay? Uh, or the Shema. Some people call it Shema, but it's the, it's called the Shema. Okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But it doesn't say love your neighbor more than yourself. If you are being a doormat, my friends, there's no excuse. If you are codependent, if you are enabling others, there's no excuse. Jesus was not codependent. Jesus did not enable anyone. Jesus was gentle and kind, and all of these attributes, he was patient. Jesus was gentle, my friends, okay? But when the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself, notice Jesus didn't say, oh, by the way, love them more than yourselves. Let them tread on you, and it's okay. You know, nobody learns that way, my friends, but we are called to live gently in a harsh world. The Apostle Paul's treatment of the Thessalonians provides a powerful model of the gentleness God desires in all of us. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bible, flip over there while I get a drink of water. We're almost finished. 
Some of you are struggling with the idea that you aren't supposed to love your neighbor more than yourself. Listen to me, my friends. I know Jesus said turn the other cheek, but that has a different meaning altogether. So if you need more instruction about that, I'll share it with you later. This concept came to me once when I was serving in a mission trip to Mexico. I was in a very poor region. I was a vegetarian at that time for a few years. And uh, anytime anything that has any type of meat in it makes me really, really sick. And while in Mexico, I continued my vegetarian diet throughout the week. The pastor of the place um, that I served, along with 17 other uh, youth, was there. And he was so offended that I wouldn't eat some of the dishes that the women were making in the kitchen. <clears throat> I asked him to respect my wishes that I'm a vegetarian and I can't eat chicken. The final day, he gave me such a guilt trip. And uh, here I am, the youth pastor, with 17 kiddos. And he said, they made this. They're asking you to eat it. And I'm telling you that you need to stop offending us and eat it. And you know, in front of my wife and all of these kids, I said, fine. And I ate it. It was some sort of chicken broth soup with some vegetables in it and stuff. And I ate the chicken and I ate it. I ate all of it. And I spent the rest of the day paying for it. Yeah, I was in the restroom the rest of the day. And I remember sharing that story with somebody when I got back. And they looked at me and they said, do you regret it? And at the time, I thought I was doing something honorable, not realizing that I was being manipulated by the pastor. And I thought I was doing the godly thing. And this mature Christian said to me, John, the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself, not more than yourself. You had to spend the day in pain, not this pastor. And I realized a valuable lesson that day, my friends, that Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. I love myself. I take care of myself. I, I groom myself. I, you know, I exercise. I try to stay in shape. I watch my diet. I love my neighbor as myself, but not more than myself. Therefore, I, I am not a doormat but I will give the shirt off my back if I can. Anyway, we're talking about gentleness, okay? One of the fruits of the Spirit, session eight. Thank you, Sue, for joining us. Uh, let me read uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 12. Yeah, some of you have never heard this concept before, and we just think as Christians we need to be doormats. You're welcome, Eileen. It's an important point. It needs to be spoken and preached in our churches. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 12. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Verse 3. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who test our hearts. Verse 5. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like little children among you. He is saying we were gentle among you. Now, he says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, verse 8, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Verse 9, surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Verse 12, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. I absolutely love that. I love that. That is the epitome of gentleness. Paul 
working with the church of Thessalonica. And then finally, my friends, this is a hard one for you. This one has been the hardest one for me. Session nine, our last one, or our last virtue is self-control. Hmm. Boy, pastor, I really liked it until this one. I struggle with self-control, pastor. You know, I want to have the fruits of the Spirit, but why did Jesus have to include that one with the fruits of the Spirit? Well, I think he put it last because he knew probably this was going to be the hardest one. Love is also really hard. These, they're all hard. But this one, I think, is especially difficult, especially for men. Now, we all struggle with self-control and temptations often blind our better judgment. But in 1 Samuel chapter 26, David faces the powerful temptation of choosing between self-gratification and self-control. His response can encourage us in our struggles. My friends, take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 26. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Don't worry. We're almost done. Let's take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 26. Talking about self-control. Wow. David spares Saul's life. Imagine this great prophet, judge, and priest, the only person who had all three titles, comes to your house. You are called out by name. And this great prophet, judge, and priest pours oil over your head and says you are going to be the next king, King David. You are only a shepherd boy, and you are serving King Saul. Your time has not yet come. You must be patient. Now, God is elevating King David to a place of great prominence, prominence and stature, great position. He is not King David yet, even though he's been anointed king. King Saul is trying to take David's life because he is jealous of David. David has several opportunities to show that he can strike down King Saul. Think about that for a second. Wow. God delivers King Saul into David's hand. And David shows great restraint and self-control, my friends. He would not, he would not put a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now, if you're saying, wasn't David the Lord's anointed? Yes, he was. But so was King Saul. And King Saul was going to be removed when God wanted him to be removed, not when David took his life. David was wise and showed restraint and self-control. So I also want you to read 1 Samuel chapter 26, my friends. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And I've been speaking for 45 minutes. And I know this is difficult for you. Some of you have anger issues. Some of you kick things, hit things. Some of you act out and cuss and, and punch things. I don't know what you do. Some of you are vengeful and mean. And, 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 and this is not one of the virtues of God, my friends. Listen, we must pe be people of self-control. So put on these virtues, okay? Let the sanctification, which is the Holy Spirit living in you, that is trying to produce fruit in your life, prune you. If he is not pruning you, then you're going to produce bad fruit. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to produce fruit. It's going to be bad fruit, sour fruit. It's going to be just ugly looking fruit, not the kind of fruit that people will enjoy. I want people to come around me and sense the fruit of the Spirit. I want them to think that I have these nine virtues. God is still working on me, trust me. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm thankful I'm not where I used to be. Amen? You're not where you need to be, 
but you're not where you used to be. I don't want you to be where you used to be. And you're not where you need to be, but you're going to be where God wants you to be. But you have to let him prune you, my friends. Continue to produce fruit in keeping with repentance by spending time with God. Let me pray for us. You're welcome, my friends. I'm glad you enjoyed this study. Father, thank you for this simple study today and reminding us the fruit of the spirits. This is a, a wonderful piece of scripture that the Apostle Paul gave us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Help us to put on these nine virtues. They're your characteristics and we can be made like Christ. We aren't Christ, but we can be made like him in that we have his characteristics. And I pray, God, that you would help us with these things because it's a struggle. And the more time we spend with you and the more repentance and honesty and transparency that we have, the more we will continue to allow you to prune us, that we will produce fruit that will last. Thank you, Father. Let us love and show kindness and gentleness and forbearance. Let us be... Um, you know, faithful to the very end. We love you, Lord, for showing us through Jesus's life in an example that he has all the fruit of the Spirit, but so can we. I thank you for those who are listening, those who are struggling with some of these, and I pray for strength that they will continue to produce mighty, beautiful fruit in keeping with repentance in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna close by saying I went to Jamaica once and I did a mission trip there. And I did about, what, five or six mission trips to uh, Mexico. Loved it. But my favorite mission trip was to Jamaica. And I sat with a pastor um, of a church there. And, wow, we were up in the poor areas of Jamaica working, you know, really hard every day. In the middle of the summer, I'd never felt heat like that before. And one of the things that they did every morning was they would bring out these big trays of fruit and vegetables. But the fruit especially was gorgeous. I mean, it looked beautiful. And it tasted like no fruit I've ever experienced. I mean, it, the, I just remember the pineapple in Jamaica and, 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 and the oranges. And, all, and, and the pastor said, nobody in Jamaica will starve. He said, we're a poor country, but nobody in Jamaica will starve because we have all these beautiful fruit trees, my friend. Be like that. Be a beautiful fruit tree that produces beautiful fruit that people will see. And they'll want to be around you because of that. Thank you, my friends, for your encouragement for this. I, I'm reading your comments, and, and I'm blessed today, too, to be able to share this with you. I've learned a few things about the fruit of the Spirit as well. Have a wonderful day, my friends. Um, Love on somebody today. Uh, call somebody. Write an encouraging note and just tell them you love them. There's people that are hurting and dealing with cancer and illnesses and COVID-19 and all this stuff. Be in a mind of prayer today and read these chapters that I've shared with you and continue to practice, uh, put into practice the fruit of the Spirit. I love you, my friends. Be blessed. Today is Thursday. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m.